Imran Yusuf. Hello, sir. Thank you for coming. Thank you for inviting me. It's, you're very welcome, and we're here in Bristol Tobacco Factory. You said it's your your first time here. At the Tobacco Factory, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I played the hen and chickens before. Mm, and you were saying that the theatre's maybe a bit a bit bigger than you thought it might be. Or yeah, I had no idea. I'd heard the Tobacco Factory, but previously, having only played the hen and chickens, um, I had no idea what this would be like, and I'm really impressed. It's um, it's nice seeing we've sold out today. Oh, right. So it's nice. Yes, yeah. So you've got, because you're sharing it with Lucy Porter, so do you both do an hour or something? Is that how it yeah, works? Yeah, I believe she's going on first, I go on second, so sharing the bill together. Right. It should be fun. Now this is an interesting one because are you you're not going to Edinburgh this year, are you? Or? I won't be going to Edinburgh this year. Right. Um, I'm taking some time off with it. Um, I'm doing lots of other stuff basically because um, I've got a bit, um, quite a bit of TV commitment and international commitment on the gig front as well. Right. So there's no need to go to Edinburgh this year. So I'm going to be doing other things basically. So these warm up gigs because quite because most of the time people are coming up with a kind of uh, a show that they've been working on a bit and with a view to do the full run. But this is Bring the Thunder. Is this is this still a, a work in progress thing for you? Or uh, tonight, is it, uh, tonight is going to be having a bit of fun, doing some um, you know good old hits, but then also working lots of new stuff for other future stuff that I'm doing. Got a bit of TV coming up, so I'm trying to work through some new stuff to to get into that. Yeah. But the Bring the Thunder tour, which I will be returning to Bristol with, it to Bristol, I'm returning to Bristol with. Yes, that's correct. Um, that will be later on in the year, right? Because you did, uh, so you did that at Edinburgh last year. Then the yeah. full, the full run. Uh, well, you, you did a full tour of the UK. Um, I've, I'll be doing my full tour of the UK with Bring oh, the Thunder right. this year. Okay. Last year, I did my full tour of an audience with Imran Yusuf, which was my 2010 Edinburgh show. Oh, I see. Right, which got so you nominated you're... for Best Newcomer. Thank you. <laughs> You've got to get that in there. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. <laughs> so, oh, so we, you, you went from one to another, yeah. and then sort of going back. To one as well is that sort of trying to get it straight in your mind is that a bit of a challenge or is that kind of okay you know going from flipping between shows a little bit like that, um, that it's good. I, I gig a lot and I'm always on the circuit so I've always got like a, my entire library of material is always in my head and it's just trying to remember all of this material belongs in that show all of this material belongs in that show and keeping it um, coherent to its narrative as well um, so today is going to be working in lots of new stuff but then also doing some good old hits and hopefully not giving away too much in preparation for Bring the Thunder because I'd like for the audience to come back to watch that as a separate show. Yes, yeah. But you say a, a lot of this stuff is working towards the TV um, stuff. That... Some of it will be, yeah. Right. There's quite a bit of TV um, on my plate at the moment so I just want to make sure I'm working it incorrectly in the clubs to make sure that it's it's bulletproof yeah. uh, for television. Well, I suppose that's the thing with TV stuff, isn't it? Because you, you want it to be short because you need such a lot of it don't yeah. you but then you, you need it to be solid and secure as well yeah it, it takes it takes whatever it takes months um, to re uh, months of consistent gigging in good quality clubs to hone a piece of material that will be ready for TV and if you do that then it will look great on television yeah. there's an art to it there's an art and even a science to getting material onto TV and making it look good there's some things that don't work well on TV and there's some things that do and knowing how to differentiate the two and then be able to deliver that is really important. Well, it's strange, isn't it? Because stand up, putting stand up on TV is such a different. It's a different thing. Indeed, yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, do you feel like you you kind of you know what you want for the TV show? You know how yeah. to make it work. You've got to be very clear about what you want to do, and you've got to understand what kind of material works best on television for the kind of comedian that you are. So this sounds like a comedy workshop, right? <laughs> yeah. So that's um, yeah. So this is going to be really helpful tonight. And it's always nice to be here because you know, there's a good culture of comedy here in Bristol, and especially between the Tobacco Factory and the Hen and Chickens, which is run by Steve. Um, yeah. that, and he does a good job of like really engendering a, a comedy savvy crowd, at which a comedian loves to play. Yeah. No, it's all. I think the comedy scene is fairly healthy, especially this area, because you've got the tobacco factory, you've got the hen and chicken, and yeah. Uh, yeah. So is this the Imran Yusuf show that you're working towards? Is it the, you, you know, because you did the pilot, the BBC yes. Three you pilot. You saw the pilot, did you? Oh, I have. Oh, yes. Did you enjoy it? It was very good. <laughs> yeah. No, I did. Thank you. So, but is this a, a series of, on the basis of that? What that was was it was that was a pilot. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's gone out now and now you know we're all kind of discussing of what happens with it in the future but here this is all about stand up material and mm -hmm. I, I really want to be working on towards like my next solo show which right. will, it'll come out when it comes out when it's ready when it's good so um, I, I'm just really looking forward to the opportunity tonight to work in some new stuff that could be used in on TV could be used in the next tour 
um, have you used any of them? Okay, yeah, but you, you know this TV sort of project that you were kind of hinting at, I suppose. Yes. Yeah. Is is that going to be a series of the brand new soft show? Or is it going to be? Or can you not tell me? You don't have to tell me. That, that um, I'm not at liberty to discuss. But oh, there okay. are, give you an yeah. example. I will be filming a Dave's one night stand on Sunday. Oh, cool! Yeah. So um, just trying to make sure that I know exactly what kind of material I want to do on that show, and I'll be using the opportunity tonight to um, kind of work on, work on some old stuff and some new stuff, which will be good enough to make that show. Right, right. I see. Just stuff like that. Yeah. And then you're gonna. Uh, you say you're working towards the next new so show, yeah. which is going to be uh, kind of probably taking to the next year, would you think? Um, I don't know. Okay. To be yeah. to be absolutely honest, the way I like what Chris Rock said at the start of his um, the Never Scared tour that he did, the Never Scared DVD, is that you know he waited he had to, he waited like three years to do another special because he had to wait for something special to happen in his life. And I think one of the situations a comedian can find themselves in is the pressure to produce another hour very quickly. But then what you'll be doing, without having anything significant to talk about, something that you really want to say, you're just writing another hour of gags mm. that your soul might not necessarily be in. And so I, I want to follow that example because Chris Rock's a hero of mine and that I am working on my next hour and I want to make sure that's quite significant because I want it to show that I have something to talk about and that as a, and as a result I've grown as a person in the time between my last solo show and the next one. Yes, and I think that's a thing because people sometimes feel the need to come back to Edinburgh every year yeah, yeah. with something with something new. And I think it's quite good that you're kind of thinking, well, hey, I, I, you know, I don't, I don't need to do that because yeah. because I, I really kind of took the imagination of everyone in 2010 <laughs> with the with the free show, wasn't it? Yeah. What was it called? Uh, it was called An Audience with Imran Yusuf and right, it was on yeah. the Laughing Horse Free Festival. Mm. So my entire plan was is that um, I wanted to learn how to do an hour's worth of comedy, which I'd never done before. So that so was I, your first hour? That was my first hour. So yeah. I thought, if I go on the Laughing Horse Free Festival, one, no one will come and see me because nobody knows who I am. Yeah. And it will give me a whole month to work in understanding how to do an hour's worth of of, of, of comedy because it's not as simple as just telling jokes you've got to take people on a journey there's got to be a narrative there's going to be highs there's going to be lows and so I thought I'll do it a whole hour no one will see me no one knows who I am I'll be totally fine and then just before I went up to Edinburgh I got the phone call saying we'd like you to be on Michael McIntyre's comedy roadshow and suddenly my name went king and loads of people came right. to watch me um, and fortunately I think you know your life is half the hard work you put in the other half is just luck just random luck and I guess I was lucky that the show was, you know, strong enough for uh, me to get nominated Best Newcomer. Yeah. Did win it, thank you, Rosine <laughs> Conaty, um, well, to be nominated. <laughs> and so it really helped my career. I mean, that, that was a crazy summer. Between my, being on Michael McIntyre's Comedy Roadshow, which I got by complete chance, mm. and, um, and, and Edinburgh, and everything that happened in Edinburgh, I was very, very fortunate that happened to me. So where, where did um, McIntyre's Roadshow come in? Did that Was that before Edinburgh that came out? I was, was that? I, was, um, I was offered it before Edinburgh. So basically, around the industry, people in the industry knew, and like the news went out to comedy people yeah. that I'd be on the show. So they all wanted to come and see what the big deal was about, because they never heard about me. Um, I'm not with one of the big agencies. You know, I'm not one of the kind of famous, cool kids that's on television, I managed to get on um, the road show by accident, just by pure accident. I happened to be in the right place at the right time, asking the right question, and I got off an audition for Michael McIntyre's Comedy Roadshow. And off the back of the audition, Michael McIntyre came up to me, and he just goes, I like what you do, and uh, good luck to you. And then he walked away. That's all he did, was just walk away. And, and then I get a phone call, and he likes what you do, and he wants you on his show, and it blew my mind. Because I never thought, I never thought that I would ever be one of those guys that gets those kind of shots. Mm. So, um, so I was very lucky. But it was lucky. quite, it was quite a quick sort of rise to fame, sort of in the eyes of everyone watching, because yeah. uh, obviously, it, you know, no one had ever heard sure, of you, sure, and then suddenly. Sure. But actually, you've probably been work, you've been working since it was 2007 your first Edinburgh. And I came, I came back to comedy in 2007. My first proper full run at Edinburgh was 2008, and then I went back in 2000. So in 2000 um, it's a long story with me. I started comedy it's years right. ago. Yeah. Did it for about two and a half years. I was an open spot. Um, I, I hit like a clinical depression, and so I quit comedy for a year and a half. Sorted my life out. Came back to comedy in the summer of 2007. Went right. This is it. This is what I want to do, and I've got to make it. 
And so I just gigged loads. 2008, I went up into the three-hander with my friends Andrew Wallace and uh, Julian Dean, which you may be hearing about soon. Um, in 2009, I went up and I, all I did was MC for a whole month. Learned how to MC. Right. What was that with? Was that with a specific show or was it? No, I was just part of the Laughing Horse. The great thing about the Laughing Horse comedy clubs is that they have a really good infrastructure that for if you're new to comedy and you really want to make it, loads of open mic gigs, really good infrastructure for someone to keep their head low and just work hard. And through the Laughing Horse through their clubs and through their free festival, um, I was able to do not only sets but also MC. So I MC'd one of the Laughing Horse gigs for a whole month, um, learned how to do that, and then in 2010 came up with an audience with Imran Yusuf, and I deliberately called it that because I thought, nobody knows who I am, no one's going to go and watch a show called an audience with Imran Yusuf, somebody they don't know. <laughs> so I'm deliberately trying to repel people from watching my show, just as long as I get enough people just to gauge whether the jokes work or not. Yeah, um, and it totally backfired in the most amazing way possible. It was supposed to be ironic, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's just boom. So, um, but I'm not complaining. No, not at all. Not, not at all. Now, an interesting thing I didn't know about you is that you were a uh, video games designer, weren't you? Yes. Quality assurance, baby. Um, uh, not a video games designer. No, I was a video games tester. It's kind of been weird with me. I got into the games industry as a dog's body. Yeah, I became an assistant producer, which is quite significant. Then things went wrong, and I ended up as a games tester for a number of companies. Um, also with Sega, hence the font. Uh -huh, yeah. Um, and and then shortly before I became a comedian, I freelanced as a video games consultant. I'm um, doing a consultant. variety. Of, yeah, consultant, wow. which is uh, quite ambiguous, but it was more than testing. It was quite um, dealing with the localization of games. De dealing with the third party groups that we all have to work with in order to get a game together so that we can release it out in different territories, North America, Europe, uh, and so on and so forth. So yeah, I was in the video games business and I loved it and I miss it. I, I really do. I miss all the friends that I made there, really good people. Uh, but I love what I do now. Yeah, I do love what Absolutely. I do. Absolutely. Now, on the basis of that, if it's okay, we're going to get you to make something out of plasticine. Right. <laughs> we'll right. get, we'll get uh, everyone to do this. So, if you want plasticine here, Ben's got some plasticine as well. Okay, you just give me a lump of purple. A lump of purple of plasticine. So, what just we're going to do purple. is make a computer games character. Right, okay. okay. Uh, preferably imaginary, so you can give some sort of explanation to what it can do. Uh, okay, so we'll have a bit of time out, and then we'll all compare notes. All right, but you okay. will have to explain yourself. So I will have to explain myself, right. Uh, we're going to start you guys with... Have far better than I have. <laughs> well, we're going to start with you. I mean, you were put under the spot, so, okay. you know, it was fine. So this is... I created a mushroom from the Super Mario series. Now, because it's purple, yeah. it could quite possibly only be a poison mushroom. So your characters need to be aware <laughs> that if they touch the poisonous mushroom, they will lose a life. They, they will lose a life. They'll, yeah. or they'll go one down, they'll go smaller. Or, yeah, it depends. Um, what, I don't know. I think yeah. it's super mode at the moment. Okay. <laughs> you only become so smaller if you're in super mode. Oh, okay. So See, what I'm... happens if you're Super Mario yeah. and you touch something that's dangerous, yeah. you then become normal Mario. Yeah. However, a poisonous mushroom will take your life away. Right. Don't have a I see. <laughs> see I, I need to brush up on my uh, Super Mario knowledge. This one is Ben's, which he says is a wizard version of Kirby, who is brilliant, but he keeps toppling over and he's lost an eye. Oh, oh no. i to put the eye back on. He looks brilliant, actually. Yeah, no, I'm very impressed. This one, I mean, he's not... He's not really based on anyone. I mean, you said um, uh, Pokemon. He, he looked a bit like a Pokemon, maybe. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, this is his gun. So he's shooting... This is, right, okay. this is like a laser this coming from his laser. gun. Okay. And his gun is so heavy that he's having trouble <laughs> lifting it up and shooting straight. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I, I mean, obviously, he doesn't have um, shoes. He, he actually runs on slug juice. On slug juice. Yeah, so yes. he, he doesn't Obviously. actually walk. And then this is a kind of guard. This is to protect him from, uh, you know, a guard. Uh, the lasers. Yeah. Oh right. Okay. And what is the guard's name? The, the guard. No, the guard is just a, a thing that. It has, oh right. You know. Okay. Not it's... a personal bodyguard. No, no. It's right. uh, okay. like a, like a shield. You know. <laughs> I love his hair. And his Very hair. Very Dragon Ball Z. <laughs> 
and his hair is to deter, obviously, from other um, from predators. From and predators. Like that. So I think we should keep those there, you know, just to um, keep the mood going <laughs> for the interview. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, the, when did you stop doing the computer game thingy? Was it um, um, as you started up comedy again? No, as I started comedy again, and I was just on the open mic circuit. Mm-hmm. I was freelancing as a games yeah. consultant. And then, um, as soon as I went full time as a comedian, um, the, the video game stuff stopped. Mm-hmm. Wait, did you say you still have kind of aspirations in that? In kind oh, of... oh, big time! Like my dream as like a kid was to make video games, and I got into the games industry and I was involved. Like one of the biggest projects I worked on was Battalion Wars Two from the Nintendo Wii, where we were a second party developer for Nintendo of Japan. Yeah. So the game was being developed in London, and our producers were in were in Japan. They'd come over and visit us a couple of times and it helped us, you know, the direction of the game until we finished it. And that was a huge privilege, making um, a game directly and exclusively for Nintendo. So um, that was a huge, yeah, that was a huge thing for me. I mean, the job that you had was, in terms of, it must be difficult to get a step in like that. And after you had that step in and you're in the industry, it must be a big decision to then go against that you, well not against that but well, drop away well it wasn't so I, I, I've always been quite ambitious about the things that I want to do there's lots of things that I'd like to do lots of things I'd like to achieve and being a video game designer and also being a comedian um, was all part of that and just working in the games industry is, is very very tough it can be very very grueling very unforgiving and, um, and it can also be very unrewarding um, to be dependent where if you don't know how to handle yourself and how to compose if you don't know how to compose yourself in your career, it, it can be very unrewarding. But I, looking back, I had a great time. I made great friends. And I know it's always there for me. And for quite a few of my friends have set up their own developers. And they now make games for themselves. Or, and they release them out on the iPad and the iPhone, things like that. So that's something I'd like to you know, keep my eye on as I'm doing my comedy. Right. But the comedy, is is it always going to be kind of probably the prominent thing? It's oh, something yeah, yeah, you yeah. always want to be oh, working absolutely. on. The great thing about comedy, the greatest thing about being a stand-up comedian is that you are given 100% unmitigated creative control over what you do. And as long as you make people laugh and you're doing your job, you do what you want. You know, I, I, you don't have to wait... You, you don't have to wake up and be at a job and be told off by a manager. I'm my own boss. I wake up when I want to wake up. Um, <laughs> you do the show you want way. to do. You do show you want to do. Um, sure, it's got to be funny. You've got to make people laugh. You've got to, you know, ultimately capture your fan base. But it's it's great for a creative person. There is no greater role because you just I don't have to ask for anybody's permission. I don't have to necessarily work with other people and then get into arguments over what direction I want to go. I do what I want to do. Mm. So and, and I love that. Whereas you know if I was a video games designer, it's like oh here's my idea and then you got to work with a team of people and then it gets into a big fight over what's right and what's wrong and which way you should go. Um, and that that can be quite tough. Although do you miss the um, consultancy sometimes in that I mean it can be very solitary and having all that freedom is great but then sometimes is it like uh, oh, you know it, it's all on me and can that can that be difficult do you sometimes look for other people's input and things like that no I enjoy what I do I really love being a stand up comedian I, my dream as a teenager was to play the comedy store um, in London mm-hmm. um, and become basically a comedy store comedian a comedian of that calibre uh, and, I've, and now that I've done that, it's, like, it's my favourite gig. I love playing there, and um, there, there's just there's no greater job. So I don't, I don't look. I miss the games industry because I love video games, not because oh it's something else that I can do because the comedy is getting too much. Comedy can never get too much because essentially all I'm ever asked at comedy is like, do you want the creative opportunity to do what you want to do? Hell yes, <laughs> of course I do. Well, because you did the um, the the, uh, the stand up. Um, co- comedy club gigs, you yeah. know, but, uh, before you did the hours, you yes. know, because now you do your touring show as well. Do you still do those 20 minute sets? Oh, yeah, and, absolutely. And you still love, you know, the atmosphere that surrounds Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. As a stand- my, the best thing to do as a stand up comedian, I think there's nothing better than playing an intimate comedy club where people are right around you, and not, can you only, you, not only can you do your set your material that you've prepared but you can talk to people have a bit of banter kind of go off on tangents mess around a bit 
that's 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 better than playing massive gigs um, and, and doing massive bits of television because you really get to you know build a relationship with an audience. So yeah, I still play the clubs because I love to, not because um you know. You have to. You know well, the thing is, it, it's I think it's important as a stand-up comedian just because you made it onto television and you've got you know you, you're kind of your passive income coming in from your DVDs and all this kind of stuff that you can relax now I've got to keep on writing I've got to keep on getting better because um, I, I want to be the best stand-up comedian that I can become I look up to my heroes like Chris Rock Dave Chappelle people like that Mark Thomas if you like from the UK I look at people like that and I'm like I've got to keep on writing and I've got to keep on getting better and it would just take years and I was, that comedy club thing is so easy to lose you know there's people that are doing the theatres and they, they can't do the stand-up sets anymore because it's oh, really? such a skill oh I think so okay. I mean Ricky Gervais I don't think he's ever done the comedy club circuit at all but he can do the theatre shows but I think it's I think a lot of people think they really want to keep kind of the the skill of stand-up going. You know. Okay. Well, I've come from the circuit. I've, mm -hmm. I've come. I, I'm at heart a club comedian, um, and then I learned how to be a bit more of a festival comedian, if you like, where you're doing a solo show and you've got an hour. And um, but I, I, I love both. But having come from the clubs, I've never leave. Like I would. It took me. You know, it's been my dreams since I was a teenager to play the comedy store and now that I've got it do you think I'd give it up hell no <laughs> yeah exactly no. absolutely not mm. but it's, it's a challenge sometimes you know when you've got a comedy club and the, uh, the conditions aren't quite right maybe or trying to win over an audience is that quite a, a, an exciting thing for you still well, sure it is I mean th that is one of the if you like dangers or challenges of being a uh, stand-up comedian is that you are often faced with environments that are not conducive um, to laughter or a good time. Sometimes, you know, a club can turn on you. Sometimes you'll have a whole group of people in that just don't like you. For whatever reason, they just like, do not like you and it's hard to win them up. Sometimes you, you're just not, you're, you're not on your game. You're not on your best game. And, uh, and it can be difficult. And um, I think, and as you start out as a comedian, you fear dying. You fear, you know, struggling in a comedy club. And by the time you've done the thousands of gigs that I've done, when it starts to go wrong, you learn to enjoy it in this really odd and perverse way. You're like, I know that you all hate me, and I know this isn't going well, but you know what? I'm going to do 20 minutes, so <laughs> let's Whether get you like this. it or not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing my contractual obligation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But and you know what? It's in those gigs. The gigs that you find the toughest, you learn the most. Mm -hmm. When a gig goes great, you don't learn much. You feel you good the about glory. yourself. Yeah, yeah. Well, you get the glory, and you feel great about yourself. But you won't learn as much. But when a gig goes wrong and when it's tough and you're fighting to keep keep, keep everything under control and win people over, um, that's when you learn a lot. Mm. Now you said you were uh, looking at kind of international stuff as well. Uh, so do you have kind of aspirations that are kind of overseas and international? Oh, indeed, you... absolutely. Um, fortunately, I found that I travel quite well um, with comedy. Um, I tra um, I, I've been. I've been to a number of countries, maybe right across the world doing comedy, and it's great fun. I've just come back from doing gigs in South Africa. So I spent four weeks in Cape Town doing the Vodacom Funny Festival, and it was loads of fun. Playing to 630 people every single night. Um, and that, it was bananas. It was great. And it was good to know that I can go out to a country where uh, I'm not from, um, and play to audiences there and make my comedy relevant to them. Of course, you've got to write material specifically to the country you're in. You've got to go to relate to people. So I didn't just do material that I have, I do here. I did material that I wrote whilst I was out there for them. Right. Um, I'm able to do that. Yeah. Whether I'm doing um, the comedy store in India, because there's a comedy store in Mumbai, <laughs> um, and because I speak Urdu, which is identical to Hindi, I can do comedy in two different languages, which is a massive oh, skill. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's loads of fun as well. It's because I can't do it anywhere else. Yeah. So over there, and now I'm shortly in a few weeks. I'm off to Southeast Asia to do gigs out in Singapore, Jakarta, Cambodia. Um, and where else am I? I'm going to be in Switzerland, I'm going to be in Norway. I'm going to be pretty much everywhere, everywhere. Maybe even one day on the moon. <laughs> Exciting stuff. Well, I look forward to, you know, and seeing where your career kind of goes next as well. Thanks very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, good luck. Cheers. And everything. And thank you for being... <laughs>